Okay, let's crack on. So, coming to the topic, before we started, I wanted to speak about nothing else but COVID-19. In specific terms, I want to speak about Dr. Lee Wen Liang. In case you're not aware, Dr. Lee was the first one to start uh, announcing, start telling the world about coronavirus. At the time, uh, he mentioned that there's a virus he's detected which seemed very similar to, to uh, SARS, and he started posting this on social media on 30th of December. Do note this is about a week, a week and a half before the official news first came out. This is what the COVID-19 chart looks today. We are closing, we are about 2 million infections. And here's my question for you. Would this be any different if Dr. Lee's warnings had been shared timely and widely? Would we be in a better world if that information was not uh, curtailed? The local, the local police did not ask him to shut up and sit down and that he was allowed to announce the virus more broadly. Would, could we have done a better job? Switching to cyber, I want to speak about WannaCry. And the reason I speak about WannaCry is because A, we are nearing the third anniversary of this infection. Third anniversary, all, believe it or not, it's already three years old. And this was an infection that was so widespread. It was, it, it impacted anyone, everyone, all of us in, in the virtual meeting today. And um, I'm sure we can relate it, to, relate it to better. Diving in, four topics I want to cover for WannaCry. First is the introduction, the what, why, when. Second attribution, who did, who did this, from where? The con conviction, what happened, law punishment, and most importantly, what happened prior to the D-Day? What is the Dr. Lee in this particular case? What information did we have before the infection started? Okay, let's crack on. First, introduction. As a reminder, on 12th of May is when this infection started and it lasted less than four days. And the reason it was so short is because one of the security researchers found a kill switch embedded in the source code and activated it. But even in that short duration, less than four days, we had 150 countries impacted and over 300,000 computers impacted. White House estimates the loss to, at, to be at around $4 billion. And the attackers made a mere 55 bitcoins, which at that point of time was worth less than $100,000. So as a reminder, this was a crypto worm. It would, in, it would, in, it would uh, crypt, encrypt all your files on your computer and ask for $300 in return for the decryption key. And the impact, as I was saying, was widespread. It impacted anyone, everyone. And it's not just the military, it's not just the government. It impacted the end user, the end consumer, the end, end citizen. We had... So brings us to the next conversation, right? So who did this? Now, attribution is a complex topic in the world of cyber, right? Unlike the real world, if you were to see a fighter jet flying up above your head and you look up and you see the Russian flag on it, you can safely say this is a Russian fighter jet. Things are not as simple in the cyber world. Attribution is a very complex topic, right? It's very easy to, to, uh, to, to hide who you really are. It's easy to hop the traffic from a different country. It's easy to hide the code. It's all, all of those trickeries are quite easily and cheaply possible. But in this particular case, things were different. We had security researchers who looked at WannaCry code very, very quickly and were able to correlate it to some of these attacks that had happened in the past. This included the famous Bangladesh bank, ha bank hack, Sony Pictures hack, and many, many others. And at the time, this group was given the code name Lazarus Group, and it was largely believed to be state-sponsored by the North Korean regime. Right? So in this particular case, attribution was done quite easily and quite quickly. This news broke out and goes without saying the first thing North Korea did was deny its role, right? It's easy to, to deny your uh, involvement in any hack, especially something that is as broad as this. So they denied it. But the story doesn't end here. Let's go to the conviction part. So the Department of Justice in US did not sit ideal. And that's, that's ideal, right? This is phenomenal. This, we do not see this for any for usual cyber hacks, right? This is out of the ordinary. So they did a phenomenal investigation and they found two email addresses, two Gmail accounts associated with WannaCry. They goes without saying, when you see, see this, you, they sent a Google, they sent Google a legal notice to share all the data. They started investigating amongst other things. They found resume of the hacker. So the story goes, the hacker had sent a job application using these same email accounts. FII, if someone were trying to do some illegal activity, don't send your job applications using the same account. It's never a good idea. For the reason, looking at the, looking at the CV, 
the investigators had the current organization of this person, the name, the age, the photograph, and pretty much anything and everything you needed about the hacker. And this is how Mr. Park ends up on FBI's most wanted list, right? So when I looked at this, I was like, this is amazing. This is, this is phenomenal. This is not something that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And now we are going to see results. But again, too hopeful. North Korea basically disputed the mere existence of Mr. Park. And we were back to square one. Till date, there's no conclusion. The, the bad guys are still at large. Brings me to the fourth and the most important topic. Before this happened, what's the Dr. Lee in this case? And this is what we need to zoom down into. This is what we need to understand much better today. So once again, the infection started on the 12th of May. The story actually starts from August 2016. This is when a group called Shadow Brokers first emerged. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is when the group called Shadow Brokers first emerged and they started announcing to the world that they had hacked NSA and they had stolen all the uh, offensive tools, all these uh, cyber warfare kind of tools that NSA was holding, all the zero days NSA was holding. They started announcing to the world. At the time, they wanted to sell it to the highest bidder. That did not work. They changed tactics. They said they will sell it to anyone who would give them 100 million bitcoins. So just to pause there, they were asking for 100 million bitcoins, not 100 million dollars in bitcoins. And that was a phenomenal amount of money, even at the time. Goes without saying, nobody paid them. And on 14th of April, they leaked all of this data, all of these uh, cyber tools, cyber warfare tools. Uh, and amongst other things, Eternal Blue vulnerability was also leaked. Now, Eternal Blue was a zero day vulnerability at that point of time that impacted every single version of Windows, Microsoft Windows at the time. So every single version of Microsoft Windows was vulnerable to this vulnerability code name Eternal Blue. And basically, Lazarus Group in less than a month picked it up, uh, weaponized it and released WannaCry. In less than a month, it was weaponized into WannaCry. But the story doesn't end here, right? A month before, on 14th March, Microsoft did release a patch, patch with the code name 17010, which would have closed this vulnerability, which would have safeguarded millions of PCs from this infection. Seems strange, seems ironic. Why something that was there for decades and decades, a, a, a loophole, a vulnerability that was present for decades and decades got patched less than a month before uh, it was leaked to the public. And of course, it's not a coincidence. When NSA figured they have been hacked, they announced it to every single vendor they were holding the zero days and the vulnerabilities for. They announced them and Microsoft released this patch. And if we had this applied, we would have been better safeguarded from WannaCry. Later on, we had two NSAs, uh, contractors convicted and till date, till date they are behind bars. So brings me to my question. And I keep asking this question over and over again. I'm going to sound like a broken record. There were enough telltale signs prior to the attack. Was this information shared timely and widely? Could we as a community, could we as the defenders have done a better job? And when I present rebuttals that I get, the first one is we're looking at this backwards. And whenever we look backwards in time, in foresight, our vision is always 2020. And it's not really true. It's not, well, it's not completely true in this particular case. For the reason, even when Eternal Blue broke out in April 2017, the security researchers were warning people that something like WannaCry was coming. People knew that this is going to get weaponized. People knew this is, we're going to have some repercussions. Everyone was surprised by the magnitude of the attack. Everyone was surprised by how much damage it caused, but no one was surprised by what happened. Right? So yes, there are telltale signs before every major attack. That's the first rebuttal. The second rebuttal I get is that WannaCry was too broad, it was too big, it, was, it wasn't subtle, it wasn't APT, it wasn't focused, it was pretty much, you know, spray and pray, impact as many people as possible. For that, I want to present a second case study. I want to speak about NPCIL, which is Nuclear Power Corporation of India, and they had an APT attack by the same Lazarus group. The same group attacked NPCIL, and in case you're not aware about this particular case study, I'll walk you through the details. First, story starts from October 2019. This is when one of the nuclear reactors in India was shut down. Okay? Now, in isolation, this means nothing. The, the nuclear plant could have been shut down for any variety of reasons. A couple of days later, 
an ex-employee of the power plant broke the news that the power plant was actually hacked and the mission critical targets were hit and that's why it was shut down. The very, ne the very next day, the government of India released a, um, released a press release and called this fake information, false, in false information, fake news. And they said, nuclear plant cannot be hacked. It is impossible for it to be hacked. And this is on the 29th of October. Less than 24 hours later, less on 30th of October, they basically made a U-turn and they said, apologies, it was a hack. In reality, it was a hack. However, the hack was limited to a certain number of PCs. The power plant, the nuclear power plant itself was not affected. That 30th of October. Now, here's my question. It doesn't matter to me what was the magnitude of the impact. It doesn't matter. The question is someone, some organization did get impacted. Now, could India or even the entire world have learned anything from this incident? Had it been shared timely and widely? Same question over and over again. Had this been shared timely and widely, could we have done a better job? Could we have avoided a case such as this, which happened on tactics? The same weapon, cyber weapon, was used by the same group to attack a different government organization of India, which is ISRO, which is a space research organization. Could we have avoided the same repeated case if we had done a better job as a defenders? And now let's not stop there, right? Let's go back in history. Once again, what information did we have before the, all of this started, right? Let's go back to September of 2019, a month before any of this information broke up. So the story goes before NPCIL was hacked, they were infect, first infected by a, a keylogger. Thanks to that keylogger, the, the attacking group, the threat actors were able to capture the credentials of an employee by the name of Pramod K. Gupta. So this person's user ID and password was captured and the story goes, these credentials were then used for the actual cyber hack. And this information was available to the research community in September 2019 because by hook or by crook or by some oversight, the, the malware itself was uploaded on VirusTotal and that's how the security researchers got wind of it and got, were able to capture this data. And in case if you're wondering if this employee really exists in NPCIL, all you have to do is Google search and you'll see NPCIL's website and you have a Pramod K. Gupta listed over there. You could also check LinkedIn and you would see P.K. Gupta over there working for NPCIL. So yes, this information seems to add up and uh, it very strongly points towards what happened to NPCIL. Right. Switching, moving ahead. The last topic I wanted to speak about was rules of war. I wanted to discuss what rules exist today, right? And starting with that, let's talk about traditional warfare first. So in the context of a traditional war, if you look at the history, United Nations was born after World War II. So United Nations was set up and amongst other things, the, the one, of, one of the noticeable uh, changes they, they bought was what is called Geneva Convention and this treaty that was signed by 196 countries. So 196 countries agreed to rules of war, war as in traditional war, they agreed to some rules of war, which including other things meant they, have, they are obliged to protect the civilians and they are obliged not to attack the civilian infrastructure. So it was made clear that by those 196 countries will not <coughs> impact the critical infrastructure of, uh, of the warring nation. Now, goes without saying, this is just a treaty and it, we know for a fact it's not always been respected. Here is one of the many, many case studies I'm sure someone can point out and which is fine. The point remains, there is something out there. There, you can. Sure, it's, it's quite dated. This, this is World War II, or just after World War II era, but it still holds true today and you could still hold a nation accountable at the back of that treaty, even though not everyone's going to respect it. My question is, what rules do we have for the, for the cyber world? Perfect or imperfect? Has anything even been created? And let's be mindful that cyber was recognized as the fifth domain of war in the year 1990s. So that's a long while back. So what rules have we created? Not only have we not created any rules, we have statements such as this, which makes me even more worried. So President Trump says, US must possess the unquestioned capacity to launch crippling cyber attacks and dominance in this area must be unquestioned. What does this mean? Does this mean it's okay to attack nuclear power plants? Is it okay to attack uh, water treatment facilities? Poison the, water, poison the water for the people? Where do we draw the line? What are the rules of cyber warfare? And the answer is they do not exist, but they should. So bring me, it brings me to the conclusion. 
we spoke about three different case studies, right? The COVID-19, WannaCry, and NPCIL. Three very, very diverse, three very, very different case studies. But to me, these can be tied together with one very, very simple message. All of them points us to a single message, which I can summarize in the words of uh, the Director General of WHO, who says the world has operated on a cycle of panic and neglect. We throw money at an outbreak, and when it's over, we forget about it, do nothing to prevent the next one. If we fail to prepare, we are preparing to fail. And this holds true in the cyber world, in the physical world, for every single case study that we can pick up. Very, very interesting words said by him. So if I can tie this together, if I can, if I can bring you some tidbits to prepare better for the next outbreak. So what could action items could you take? What are the messages you, can, you could take from this, this talk of mine? The first would be cyber is a cheaper, faster, easier way to attack. It costs very little to launch cyber attack and the repercussions are huge. They could be really damaging. Secondly, attribution is complex. Denial is easy. North Korea still denies involvement of WannaCry. The, the people, the person, the group who, who launched that attack is still out at large. They have not been, uh, they've not been uh, tried in any court. Cyber has no borders, <clears throat> law enforcement does. Enforcing cyber law has been always been a very complex topic. Collaboration and sharing helps tremendously. If we had shared the information, if we had shared that the details that, that security researchers had before the, uh, the major outbreaks happened, if we future depends on it, and that's how we can save our, safeguard ourselves from the next outbreak. I end over here. My contact details are up on the screen, and I'll hand it over back to Link. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kunal. That's been a... Um... Kunal had shared this with Ben and I before when we were preparing for this, uh, for this, for this webinar, and... and um, it was, it was just, I suppose, seizing upon the moment to talk about analogs and how, you know, one can look at patterns and from, from, a, uh, from, a, from a perspective of hindsight. But uh, before we actually kind of like go back to talk about, um, you know, for me to kind of like introduce the next speaker. So I have to jump in here with some meeting logistics, uh, something I was supposed to do at the end, but I think because... <laughs> You know, forgive us, this is uh, the first, second time we're doing this and we're trying to get a, a good sort of like flow here. So all of you may have noticed that, uh, that uh, participants are muted, both audio and video during the presentations. Uh, this will be, this will be un, there will be an, an opportunity for unmuting when we come to the Q&A uh, section of this uh, webinar where you can ask questions in chat where we'll ask you to introduce, introduce yourself briefly in the chat, your name and organization, and indicate that if you want to be unmuted to ask the question. Uh, for your information, we will only be archiving the presentations, not the Q&A. So there's, a, there's some, there's some uh, confidentiality there. And there will be no other recording of this meeting by video and or audio. So with that, I am going to then move to introduce Bill who will be speaking to us about his work in information sharing. Let me just call up my slides. So Bill Nelson is the chair and CEO of the Global Resilience Federation and is based in the US. So he's joining us uh, from the US in the evening or on, on a Wednesday. So before joining the GRF in 2019, Mr. Nelson was the president and CEO of the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center from, 20, uh, from 2006 to 2018. So that's a good long time. And he speaks with the benefit of a lot of experience and hindsight. And Bill will speak to us about information sharing, the keystone of enterprise security. Over, you to, over to you, Bill. Well, thank you, Lin, Ling. And uh, thank you, Kanal, for that great introduction. I think you... Uh did an outstanding job uh, kind of setting the stage for really what some of the issues are. And I think your comparison to COVID-19 and being prepared uh, and sharing when you can really prevents attacks from being successful. So I think that's, that's the key is preparation. 
a little bit of, uh, you gave a little bit of my background. I was, um, I was CEO of the financial services ISAC from 2006 to 2018, as you mentioned. And uh, during that time, I saw the organization grow from uh, about 150 to 200 members to over 7,000 by the time I left. And these are companies, uh, all financial services companies around the world in about 50 different countries. Uh, I was also the, I'm the CEO now of the Global Resilience Federation, and I'll get into some details next about what that is. It's a nonprofit corporation that develops and, and really supports through information, uh, through a number of tools that we have and capabilities, information sharing communities, and really coordinates uh, across uh, cross-sector intelligence sharing. Uh, when I was at FSISAC, we kept getting asked we were kind of viewed as the gold standard, if you will, of uh, information. Uh, different organizations would ask us for help and they'd ask to join and we'd say, well, you're not a bank, you're not an insurance company, sorry, you can't join. Eventually in 2014, I convinced our board to allow these organizations to join, but as a separate entity and we sort, uh, actually formed a group called Sector Services to support those communities. And uh, the first three that were formed were legal services. These are law firms, uh, oil and gas ISAC, we started that, and a group called RSISC, which was really retailers. At that time, there was a whole slew of major retailer breaches that had occurred, uh, mostly in the US, but really around the world that were uh, affecting uh, retailers, uh, mostly cards being hacked, uh, other types of data breaches of information. Uh, later, we added an energy group, Ease, uh, Healthcare ISAC joined, uh, FS ISAC, we were supporting them too. And then in uh, 2017, uh, we decided, uh, actually at the beginning of 2018, we, uh, end of 2017 and 18, we became GRF, the Global Resilience Federation. I was still heading up FS ISAC, but I was chair of, the first chairman of uh, GRF, and we ended up turning that uh, over to a woman who was uh, president. Uh, unfortunately, she uh, passed away a year ago. Um, and I had I left my job at FSISAC to go work with her at uh, GRF and became CEO. Um, before she passed away, she uh, died suddenly. But uh, since then, we've added the National Retail Federation. Uh, we've added Professional Services Group, Information Exchange, and Downstream Natural Gas ISAC. Most importantly, what I'm going to talk about today is the OT ISAC. Uh, to give you, and that is ba actually based in Singapore. Our operations are uh, predominantly here in the U.S. and around Washington, D.C., and we have staff in Texas, New York, uh, uh, geez, Miami, Florida, North Carolina, uh, New Jersey. Um, but our main operation here is in D.C. and also in Singapore. And we formed this OT ISAC with uh, really, it, it was the uh, brainchild of the CSA, the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. And they're our partner in this and really a driving force behind it. Its mission is to help assure the resilience and continuity of operational technology uh, using organizations and their infrastructure against threats and acts that could significantly impact their ability to provide critical services to Singapore. Uh, I think it's gonna be a much broader mission over time. Uh, it's already, we're getting a lot of interest in the whole uh, Asia Pacific uh, region to join and some members have started to join from outside of Singapore too. Uh, the key objectives for setting up the OTI SAC are to create a platform of trust. And we think about information sharing. Uh, when you're sharing information, how do you know it's not going to be leaked to the press? Uh, when you're sharing that information, uh, is it going to be uh, something that could come back to you in terms of uh, bad publicity, et cetera? So that's the key is to create that platform of trust. And I'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to tailor the OT cyber information sharing for Singapore's needs. That's why we established it in Singapore. So it's a local regional ISAC and the, the usefulness and relevance of the information uh, will be for the Singapore uh, needs uh, and, and industries there. Uh, the uh, 10, actually 11 different sectors that it supports. Um, we also build out OT cybersecurity analytics and response competencies and foster cross-border cooperation and on OT cybersecurity. So it's a combination of OT and IT, and I'll talk about that next. There is an interconnected nature of technology. And if I think about IT, and my background in the last 30, 40 years has really been on the IT side, 
And it was always sort of a, uh, I guess you'd call it uh, air gapped, almost a physical isolation between uh, devices and systems. But that's changed. Uh, in the consumer world, you have IT systems and, and business systems, uh, office PCs, printers, web apps, et cetera. Uh, you have the Internet of Things, which can be consumer driven or some businesses use a lot of these two tablets, smartphones, et cetera. And then in uh, control systems, though, uh, you manage the you know, physical access through controllers, uh, uh, industrial networks, uh, of course, you have sensors, cameras, embedded systems, industrial control systems. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the Internet of Things, the industrial Internet of Things, is really now being uh, connected to the IT world. And that poses a whole slew of potential risks. Um, this, is a, this is a really good diagram. Uh, Kanal talked about the, um, the nuclear power plant uh, hack that occurred, but there have been many other uh, attacks that have occurred. And this is not all inclusive. There's been some in South Africa, there's been others around the world that are not mentioned here, but these cyber attacks are impacting OT systems and operations, and that's increasing. Can cause disruption, stoppages, and even uh, physical uh, damage. What, how can organizations really protect their enterprises? I think the key is cyber hygiene. I could spend 90 minutes on talking about security controls. I'm not gonna do that today. Um, I look at you know, some of the things that you'd want to do uh, in terms of protecting your system, in terms of data loss prevention, uh, capabilities like multi-factor authentication, encryption, uh, et cetera. These are all important. And a lot of that should be based on a risk assessment uh, that you have done of your enterprise, whether it be a government enterprise or a private organization. You should also patch. Uh, a lot of times, uh, patching priorities become a key issue. Uh, we're looking at that to try to really help define that better. Uh, I think you mentioned, uh, Kanal, that Microsoft had a patch for that one um, vulnerability that was discovered by shadow brokers uh, or, or uh, uh, obtained by shadow brokers. Uh, that happened fairly quickly, but it did not get out quick enough to prevent WannaCry from happening. Uh, the importance of patching your systems is, is key and uh, making sure you have the right priority for that. I think the other important thing is information sharing. Uh, you touched on that, that collaboration and sharing really helps tremendously in terms of protecting yourself and uh, others in your, in your sector. This is really, the OTI SAC uh, is really about working together and collaborating. It allows organizations to share cyber and, and OT threat information for mutual defense and it really proactively preventing threats uh, seeing these that are uncovered and then if uh, what are the impacts and uh, discovering if these things are really happening in, in your systems in your enterprise. So we do share actively information on malicious activities including phishing campaigns, malware attacks, and vulnerabilities and of course uh, TT, what we call TTPs or tactics, techniques and procedures. Uh, we do share voluntarily uh, the members and you can share even anonymously. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we have analysts that review, scrub, and enrich data. This is analysts working for GRF uh, and uh, the OTI SAC. You become more resilient as, as a result. And uh, realize, really analyzing the impact of IT attacks on OT systems is very critical. Let's see what, how this happens, though. Uh, you have an attack occurring at a, at a company or government entity agency uh, that's reported into um, a security ops center that's operated by either the OTI SAC or GRF, in this case in Singapore, it'd be the OTI SAC. Uh, that can be done on a secure portal, completely anonymously, or you can share it if you wanna uh, share the fact that it came from you, that would be fine too, but uh, many members actually share anonymously if it's sensitive. Uh, that information, those threat indicators or their tactics, uh, techniques, procedures used are then shared with other members they in turn share that internally, analyze it, apply patches or apply uh, fixes or risk mitigation methods. Uh, and then that's shared with the whole community. As a result, people have ideas about best practices, risk mitigation, 
that they can actually help the attacker uh, in turn and prevent others from uh, having the attack to occur. This is a, a interesting diagram of a sharing community intelligence cycle, uh, starting with the submission. These are cyber incidents mostly, uh, attributed or anonymous uh, requests for information. Uh, there's then analysis that's done uh, mostly by other members, but also oftentimes by the, the OTISAC analysts, uh, content evaluation, uh, open source and dark web research, and, uh, and, the, and then a development of a list of the uh, indicators of compromise. Uh, it's then disseminated in a standardized reporting format. Some of this is a report you might read, Other, uh, a lot of it is actually shared in an automated format too. Uh, and analyst analyst threat calls and, and just cross sector sharing. It can be automated or uh, in person, well, not much in person during COVID 19, but uh, sharing mostly during threat calls. And then feedback, uh, you know, secure chat with analysts, member peers, member workshops, webinars, mostly webinars right now, uh, surveys and polls, uh, member services, uh, and best practices are then uh, shared. So this is our OTI SAC approach. It's really taking actionable cyber and physical intelligence for warning and mitigation, community collaboration that occurs after that on different ways, uh, education and training. I view this as a opportunity that Ling and, and uh, RSIS have, have provided uh, for me to actually get out and, and talk about what we do and the importance of information sharing is part of that. Uh, technology and tools, uh, uh, providing uh, options. We, we don't really recommend any particular vendor for technology solutions, but we do work with vendors and, and suggest that you talk to them and we can certainly pass on uh, through uh, solution workshops and other things uh, to provide you some ideas of what tools that you can implement to protect yourself. It's also this, uh, this idea of building trust. I talked about anonymous sub submissions. I haven't talked about the TLP or the traffic light protocol. I'll do that next. And this is a members only, member driven community. So if you're eligible to join, you can join and then start sharing uh, in this uh, type of environment. Uh, and then managing crisis. When there is industry-wide mitigation response during crisis impacting the community, that, that occurs too. Uh, these are examples of ISAC member submissions. Um, a lot of them are things like scans or probes, probes that are occurring, uh, some insider threats that might occur, uh, phishing attacks, uh, social engineering, uh, the malware itself, the executable files. Um, these are a list of indicators of compromise on the right that can occur. It could be the IP addresses where the attack was originated from, the file names. It could be simple things like uh, the uh, uh, URLs that, that were, uh, you, know, you know, block that URL, make sure you uh, don't allow any of your staff to access that domains, hashes, and email addresses. Uh, also, subject lines and emails is also important. Uh, impact information, what, was, what, were, what were these threat actors actually trying to get? And what actions can be taken to mitigate it? And then a lot of these mitigation strategies are actually shared between the members. It's not all coming from the analysts that work for the Global Resilience Federation or OTISAC. Sometimes that is coming from the members themselves. Uh, I do want to spend one minute on uh, traffic light protocol. I think this is very important uh, to understand. Uh, this concept actually uh, was revealed to me first in about 2007. I think I went to a meeting at the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., met with some MI5 types, and they said, hey, you've got a great information sharing system, but you're not using the TLP. And I said, well, so what's that? And it's basically a, a method where the originator of the information says how it's going to be um, handled by everyone else in the in the community. So you could say this information is amber, it's confidential, and it can't really be shared outside the community or really maybe even outside your organization. If it's green, it can be shared with community members, other sharing groups, maybe partners, maybe uh, your customers even in some cases or uh, uh, other uh, vendors but it can't be shared on a public forum. And then white means it can be shared freely and subject to standard copyright rules. It might be a report that we read, some open source information. And then another way red is used most frequently, it's not, there's not much information itself that's read, but a lot of times 
in, in part of a group and part of a dialogue that might be going on, a member will say, the information I'm giving you is green, but the source is red. So you're not to reveal it came from me. So they can still share it anonymously. They could do it by sharing anonymously on the portal, but if they're having a dialogue, this, that's one way they, they want to handle it. And that works very well, and it's really set up in the operating rules that when you join, you're to obey these operating rules and uh, you, you obey the traffic lake protocol. So this is the OTI SAC and network sharing pathways. I, won't, I don't think I have a lot of time left, but uh, information so sources can be certs, uh, um, can be Interpol, uh, regulators, police warnings like from Interpol, agency reports, private sources, uh, threat intel vendors that we may use, uh, may have a, a uh, be purchasing services from dark web vendors, uh, vulnerability vendors, et cetera. Uh, we also work with other ISACs. There's uh, about 25, 26 ISACs that we're also connected to uh, and open sources. And then member collaboration. In, in the member himself, there, there may be uh, people that just want to receive physical security alerts, business continuity alerts, system management alerts, or in charge of IT security, they just want to get IT information, or they're in charge of OT security and Intel. They just want operational technology information. And those arrows are going both ways, as you can see. So you're receiving and you're giving, hopefully. We don't require you to, to share, but we certainly encourage you to do it. Uh, this is just an example of a member notifying uh, OTI SAC of a campaign with links leading to IT, uh, OT level access. Uh, that is then analyzed and uh, alerts are then sent out to the community and they share that information and results back to ISAC and then the attack is uh, thwarted. Um, to wrap things up, this is uh, just showing some partners in, in Greater Sharing Network. We with a lot, work with a lot of companies, some in the IT space, uh, some in the learning space, um, defining a return on investment, that's Fair Institute, and some of the others are uh, OT vendors. And these are the different, uh, again, the uh, ISACs that we, and communities that we support today. Um, the other thing we have is access to secure information platform through mobile and web app. I'm not going to go into all this, but we have a portal mobile app, uh, access to alerts, ability to create content actually on a mobile app, which makes it a lot easier, real-time discussions going back and forth with members and the uh, analysts, surveys that you can do, uh, member submissions, and you can set your own profile settings. And uh, there's a desktop app and home screen too, uh, document repositories, uh, and uh, member directories. This, by the way, is all, all uh, uh, GRF staff and, uh, and actually a couple board members um, and discussion boards also. So that was it. I think I've taken up my 15, 16 minutes. Um, if you want any inf further information from me, that's my email address, bnelson at grf.org. Again, we're a, uh, happy to hear from you and uh, happy to take questions now. If I can't answer it, I'll ask Kunal to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much, Kunal and Bill, for the for the information and the insights. And we're going to move into um, the Q and A part of the uh, of the session now. Um, I'll just say a little bit. I'll just say something at the outset about the uh, the composition of the participants we have today. We have a lot of people from the government sector. We have some people from the embassies, and uh, we also have uh, a sizable number of people from the private sector as well as academia. So this is actually a really interesting cross section of participants. You know, uh, coming to you know think about these things and to um, to hopefully we can sort of encourage some thinking in this direction about information sharing and, and timeliness and also the benefits of collaboration. So I have a number of questions here, which I'm going to end.